This is Dr. Charles Parker, and you're listening to Core Brain Journal. It's a place where I connect both fresh discoveries and interesting different perspectives from advanced mind science with the realities of real people and everyday life down on Main Street. Well, welcome board folks. Dr. Charles Parker here one more time at Core Brain Journal. We have an interesting guest. We've had some other people talk about resilience. It'll be in uh, Linda Graham's show notes. But today we have Linda Graham. Linda, thank you so much for joining us. I really appreciate it. Thank you for having me, Chuck. I'm glad to be here. It's going to be fun. And Linda is going to talk to us, folks, about something every single listener here can appreciate and benefit from. And she's going to be talking to us about resilience. And so what I'm going to do is just say a quick word from our sponsor here. And then we're going to come back and we're going to formally introduce Linda to you. And we will go from there. So. Our sponsorship is from Great Plains Laboratory. We're very pleased that Great Plains has joined us. They are world thought leaders in terms of two things. They not only provide outstanding laboratory testing protocols, but they have webinars for practitioners who really don't understand how to take these testing modalities into their everyday practice and use them effectively with people who are stuck wherever they're stuck. We find here and uh, we do this at course site testing. We test for people when they're treatment failures because very frequently there are biomedical impediments. So if you want to go over there to greatplainslaboratory.com forward slash CBJ for Core Brain Journal, you can go over there and register for a complimentary test. They do this once a week. They put these tests out. So I think it's going to be of interest to you and give it a shot. That'll be fun. So let me tell you now about Linda. And she is Linda Graham. She's an MFT. She is out in beautiful downtown San Francisco. I don't really know where she is, but I can see it was San Francisco on my phone. (laughs) So we'll, we'll talk a little bit about that. But let me tell you about her. She is a person who is an expert on resilience. And let's talk a little bit about what it is, and then we'll talk more about her. Resilience is the learned capacity to cope with any level of adversity, from a series of small annoyances to the struggles and sorrows that break our hearts. Uh, confidentially, Lynn and I have had some very small annoyances in getting this set up. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> and we're practicing resilience as we speak. <laughs> That's right. So resilience is essential for surviving and thriving in a world of troubles and tragedies, and it's completely trainable and recoverable when we know how. And Linda is going to tell us about that. She has focused for years on helping people strengthen capacities to cope with the challenges and crises of their lives, to recover an authentic sense of their, themselves, deepen into healthy, resonant relationships and engage with the world through meaningful and purposeful work. She became a licensed marriage and family counselor therapist in 1995. She specializes in helping people reverse the impact of stress and trauma, manage their anxiety, depression, loneliness, and shame, shift out of reactivity, contradiction, contraction, and smallifying to more openness, trust, consciousness, compassionate connections and cultivate the mindful awareness that shifts their perspectives so they have more options and wise choices. So with that, that's what we're going to be talking about. And let's get started with the basic question that we like to always ask everybody here, because I think it helps the narrative. You know, what's what's going on? Linda, how did you, first of all, you started relatively recently with a marriage family. So, but then you've been interested for some time in this. How did you get interested in this particular part of marriage and family counseling? Okay, so I have been an MFT for 25 years in the San Francisco Bay Area, and most of my work involves helping clients recover their resilience at any level of disruption, barely a wobble, the serious struggles, or the too much of trauma. And what I've learned is that clients have that capacity. They don't always know that they do but it's a capacity innate in their brain, so it can be strengthened and recovered. And I got interested because I began to see, if I can tell you my own story of one of those moments where that happened, 
Okay, so I was actually walking to my office in San Francisco. I parked in Golden Gate Park and I could walk through the park to my office. And I was thinking about something. I was worried about something. So I wasn't paying any attention to where I was going. And I stepped into this sidewalk of freshly laid wet cement up to my ankles. And the cascade of critical thoughts started right away. You stupid clots, look what you did. Ouch. You're going to be late to work. You're going to have to reschedule clients. You're going to lose clients. You're going to lose your business. And I could do that in about three seconds. So for once, I stopped and said, wait a minute. I'm really kind of sick and tired of going down the rabbit hole, criticizing myself just because I made a mistake. I'm not the only person on the planet that made a mistake today. This is probably not the only mistake I'm going to make today. So I can work with this differently. I can shift my attitude here and work with this differently. So I took my feet out of my shoes and I pulled my shoes out of the cement and I walked over to this nearby apartment building. They had an outdoor water faucet. It really did happen that way. And I was realizing, well, wait a minute. I could approach this differently. I could relate to myself differently. I could have a different attitude here. And the workers came over with some paper towels to help me wipe off my shoes. And I realized If I can shift my attitude in this moment, I can shift my attitude in any moment. And that was the big shift for me. If I can do it in this moment, I can do it in every moment. And then later, I picked up this quote from a colleague of mine, Frankie Perez, and he says, you know, how you respond to the issue is the issue. So I began to get very interested in helping my clients strengthen their capacities to pause be with whatever was happening, notice their own reactivity, their own contraction around it, and use the tools that we know help regulate the nervous system, come back into some emotional equilibrium, relate to themselves in a kinder, more compassionate, positive way rather than beating themselves up, being able to relate to other people and pull in other people as resources and refuges, like the construction workers that, you know, help me wipe off my shoes. And then to cultivate their capacities to reflect, to pause and step back and reflect. What are my choices here? What are my options here? And to be able to choose the wiser option. So that's how I got interested in resilience, but also in the neuroscience of resilience, the neuroplasticity of the brain. How does the brain change? How do we create different ways of responding? How do we rewire the old ways of responding? And so that's what led to bouncing back and resilience. Well, that is such a very good story because every single one of us have had our feet in the concrete at one time or another. That's right. No question yeah. about it. And I love that quote. I had to write it down while you were talking because I thought, oh my gosh, what a, what a tremendous quote. For anybody in having any kind of a psychological adjustment problem to, to changing uh, vagaries of life, mm-hmm. to come in and think about that the issue is how you respond to the issue. Right. So let me say this. From behavioral science research, we know that there are several factors that predict how resilient someone is going to be. One is the severity of the external event, whatever that is. In other words, it's different if you're in a fender bender from being in a car accident that causes an injury, from being in an accident where you cause the death of a child. The severity of the stressor has something to do with how resilient we are. The strength of our external resources. Can we call on family and friends? Do we have financial resources, medical resources, and counseling resources? But the third factor is our own inner capacities, our own inner strengths. And that's what most people think of in terms of resilience, grit, determination, perseverance, the will to survive, the will to endure, our own capacities of courage and compassion and clarity, being able to think think clearly. And that's where we can actually, this is when we know how, when we actually know what tools will strengthen those inner qualities of resilience, how can we get the brain to relate to ourselves and the external world differently, then that's where people can learn to be resilient. And what I hope is to teach not only those tools, there are 130 tools in the new book, but Mm. not just teaching the Mm. tools, teaching people that they can learn these tools and they can learn how to change their brain change their responses for the better. And it's that sense of empowerment. I can do this. I can learn to do this. I am a learner. I am becoming resilient. That I think is the great gift of this focus that people really can change their lives. Well, let's take a moment to plug that book as one of the reasons we're here. I mean, this is, and the name of the book is Resilience, Powerful Practices for Bouncing Back from Disappointment, Difficulty, and Even 
disaster, which is what she was just talking, what Linda was just talking to us about a moment ago, because there are the varieties and the vagaries, you know, and we've talked to a number of people about this, Linda, but I don't think I've ever heard it so explicitly stated as, as you did just now with the varieties of mm -hmm. the situation itself and the varieties of capacity and the varieties of brain set really is what you're talking about. And really the thing is, I'm, I'm hoping today we can talk about some of those because I think everybody here would like to get a little bit of, hey, what could I do? I mean, yeah, the book would be interesting, but I'd also like to get, give us a little tease on, on what we could do today if we have that fender bender on the way home. Okay, so I do think that resilience, our capacities to be resilient, are foundational, whether we're meeting the fender bender or whether we've just lost someone we love or caused the death of someone we love. And so the capacities to be resilient, regardless of the situation, and even regardless of the level of external resourcing that we have at the moment. So the way I organize the book, and this is what people could begin to do <laughs> right away. I organize the book by somatic intelligence. There are body-based tools we can use of breath and touch and movement and visualization that can work immediately. Mm -hmm. to restore the physiological equilibrium of the nervous system of the body brain so that we're able to bring the higher brain back online and actually deal with the situation. There's emotional intelligence and how do we manage that very quick survival responses of anger or fear or sadness or disgust? How do we come out of the negativity bias of the human brain back into more positive, open-minded, receptive, optimistic points of view. And one of the things that I teach in the book, in the workshops, is that positive emotions, if you can cultivate gratitude, kindness, compassion, joy, awe, delight, contentment, when we cultivate those positive emotions, the direct, measurable, cause and effect outcome is resilience. We know that from the science. So when I encourage people to do a gratitude practice or a compassion practice or a generosity practice, they're shifting how their brain functions from negativity to more positivity. They'll be more resilient. Then I also talk about relational intelligence within ourselves. We need to have self-awareness, but also self-acceptance, self-appreciation, being able to see ourselves with all the flaws and faults we might have, to see ourselves in a positive way. We have an inner secure base of resilience so that inner critic doesn't take over. And then the relational intelligence with others so that we can actually pull in resources from other people. Many people, you know, part of the trauma or difficulty or disaster of someone's life is that they've been hurt by another person. And so very often people are wary. It's hard to trust that another person will actually be helpful. So I'm offering tools to heal that, to get over that. And then the, the fifth is reflective intelligence and how do we use our mindfulness, our mindful awareness to pause and notice and name and step back and shift our perspective. So one of the tools that I teach people right off the bat, change every should to a could. Just change every should to a could. Because should implies obligation and, and performance, and it sets you up for failure. Whereas the mind contracts in the face of that. But the could opens us up to possibility. And if people did that one self-talk practice of changing every should to a could, every time they hear themselves shooting on themselves, you know, <laughs> change it to a could, their mind will operate differently and they will be able to be more resilient. So I try to offer tools. What I say is the tools that I'm offering work the way the brain works, which means learning from experience, but also little and often small practices repeated many times over time is what will create the change in how the brain is functioning. So most of these practices can be done in 10 minutes, and maybe you do that five times a day for five weeks in a row. But there's small practices that you can, when they're repeated over time, will actually change how the brain is functioning. You know, I can think of so many people that could be helped with this because it's so practical. I'm, you know, one of my favorite words, and everybody here that listens to me on a regular basis knows that I love the word utilitarian. Mm -hmm, <laughs> and, mm -hmm. and you are really laying it right out on the table with some very useful utilitarian concepts and actual yeah. practices. Right, because I want people to learn ways to be resilient, more resilient, in ways that are safe and efficient and effective. You know, it's to be able to cope better this afternoon than you did this morning or better next week than you could this week. 
Well, now, while we're talking about your book, let's take a moment. I'll, I'm going to ask you a question in a moment that I want to come back to, which is uh, not to put you on the spot, but a question I'm going to ask you in a moment is, is about where you've experienced difficulties as a therapist and with people in that regard. But let's, let's hit the workshop real quickly. You alluded to it quickly. And in the material that I got here, I didn't quite see that. And I, and I think it'd be good for us to talk about that. Is it a local San Francisco only workshop? Do you do a virtual workshop? How does, how does all that work? Okay. So really what I'm referring to is I teach all over the country. And in fact, I teach all over the world. So I'm offering workshops on the neuroscience of resilience or healing from loss and trauma with compassion, clarity, and courage. I offer various workshops in various settings. So nice. people would go to my website on my calendar, and that's where they're all listed. There's a possibility of having an online course next spring, but I'm just beginning to work on that. So on that, that website is lindagram-mft.net. That's right. That's the one. So that'll that's be on the show note, folks, just to be sure. So, so what happens is you go to a, a, a venue, like, you know, Alaska or whatever, and you have like a weekend retreat or is it a, a one day or how does, it, how does it work? I've done one days, I've done weekends, and I've done five day retreats. So materials just expanded as we have more time. But it's organized by what I just said, those, the body-based, the emotional, the relational, and the reflective intelligences. So we're building skills as the brain builds them from the bottom up. So I teach skills first for people to be able to come to a sense of what's called the range of resilience, but their natural physiological equilibrium, where they're not too revved up in fight flight, and they're not too shut down in numbing out or collapsing. They're just in that middle range where they can actually begin to see what's happening, see how they're reacting, and think about how they want to respond. So well, I'm going to ask about that difficult patient in just a minute, but you know, you're saying so many things that are useful. You don't know this about Core Brain Journal, but we're very interested in uh, vets and combat stress. And we have okay. a whole page of experts who have weighed in on combat stress and recovery and traumatic brain injury and PTSD and all that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. And we have uh, talked to a number of really interesting uh, professionals who've done some research with uh, accelerated response therapy, which is a whole mm -hmm. other level of, of care here. But I think the way you're talking about it has a number of more in-depth aspects to it. it. Do you have some experience working with, see, my thought of it while you were talking, and I, I, don't, know, I don't know anything about what you're doing. I'm learning about it from you, but right. it sounds to me that a person coming back from uh, a war trauma, which has multiple traumas, and so many, mm -hmm. and that whole shell shock thing of coming home, going into a different reality. Right. It seems like they get completely untrained from uh, resilience in some way with that, that it would be more than just a single event. You're dealing with an entire series of events. Do you think that has a special application to individuals who are coming back from trauma who are, who are vets like that? So what I would offer is the research that's been done by the people who are researching post-traumatic growth. And in fact, They've interviewed many, many combat veterans and prisoners of war and people who have been in the most dramatic and traumatic situations. So I'm taking, I'm just passing along what they have found. So I'm boiling it down to five phases that people go through to be able to come out of the trauma, even when it's really piled up and affected how their brain is functioning. So the first is acceptance of reality and the consequences of reality. And that has found to be one of the most significant predictors of whether people will come out of trauma and into mm -hmm. post-traumatic growth. It's just accepting reality. Yep. This shit happened. Okay. <laughs> said that on the radio. And then the, once that happens, then you begin the other steps. The first is resourcing with people. And that means just simply being able to be with people where you can tell your story without having to defend or explain or justify. And that's why often combat veterans prefer talking to other people who have been in combat because they know what it's like out there. They know what happens out there. But being able to be with people who are what are called compassionate companions, not people trying to fix or give advice, but just can listen and absorb what you're saying. Mm -hmm. It also helps then when people can begin to share their own story and begin to share their own stories of their own resilience. The third step is fine. It is counterintuitive. Most people wouldn't think of this, but finding the positive in the midst of the negative because the person, the being, the brain needs breathing room. It needs a respite. It needs to enjoy a warm cup of coffee or the smile of a child or playing with a puppy or walking in nature. 
so that you're not in the darkness all the time and you don't feel alone all the time. That leads to being able to find the silver lining, find the lessons learned, what Jonah Lehrer calls turning the regrettable moment into the teachable moment. And there may be many moments. It mm-hmm. may be that the lessons don't seem to outweigh all the bad stuff that happened. But when can, people can begin to find the lessons, the silver lining, the turning point, then they're beginning to claim that what they learned can somehow redeem what has happened or what they were asked to do, which can then lead to a coherent narrative. And, and the researchers have found that when people write their experience, the brain is operating differently than when we're just thinking about it or when we're talking about it. And there's something about writing and using words and using symbols that helps people get a little more objectivity, a little more distance. It puts sort of an emotional buffer there. So people will write the coherent narrative. This is what happened. This is what I did at the time. This is what I've learned. This is what I would do differently now. And then coming to a sense of And is there any new meaning or purpose or sense of direction, Mm -hmm. new connection with family, with community, new possibilities? Mm -hmm. And when people can come into that phase of, yes, there's new opportunities, there's new life. There was before, there was the event, many events, and now there's the after. And so what I've learned is that it's not so much about combat veterans sometimes bouncing back, but about bouncing forward into a new life that has new possibilities. When people can say, this is what I learned, or this is the new life that's available to me, not just in spite of what happened, but because of what happened, not just in spite of, but because if it hadn't happened, my life would not have gone in this direction. And to be able to find the opening, the positive meaning of that. So there's a long arc of recovering from trauma, very serious trauma. But those are some of the steps that are involved. And when people have hope that they can recover and come into a sense of resilience and purpose again, then they can go through those steps with the help and support of other people. I love your aphorisms and your, your little statements. It's, it's, if you've been in recovery at all, I worked in addiction recovery for a long period of time. And they have all these great little pithy, uh-huh. Uh-huh. here's how you can conceptualize this in a it's sort of a, a branded moment. You know, it's not branding, is uh, implies marketing, but it, it wraps it up so concisely and so mm-hmm. effectively. And you do a great job of that. You know, yeah. that whole idea of the forward leap as opposed to just coming back. You know, where can you, where are you going to go right. next? In it? That there are a lot of pith quotes <laughs> in my book and on the website because there are many, many people who have said many, many wise things about resilience, and we can get support even familiarizing ourselves with those words of wisdom. I'm glad you said that, because I mean, I'm totally a quote nut. I confess that I, if you get over in a core brain journal, you see I'm quoting everybody over there. And I, because I think there's so many little pithy aphorisms that completely change your point mm-hmm. of view if you actually reconceptualize what they say and what the context of your life is at that moment. Here's the quote that sort of summarizes that. It's from James Lowell. Mishaps are like knives that cut us or serve us as we grasp them by the blade or by the handle. Wow. Ah, that's heavy. Got to write that one down. I can see the grasping going on out there. Yes. Oh, my Mm -hmm. gosh. Well, listen, here's the question I'm going to ask you. It's probably going to sound a little mundane, but I think it's really good to, in a way, personalize your, your experience with uh, individuals. And the question I want to ask you about is, you are such a well-educated, pithy person, if you forgive me for saying that, but I mean, you're, you're on it very well. I just love the quotes and the whole thing. But the question that I'm going to ask you, we're going to take a break here in a second, but the thing is, I think it's always useful to see what are some of the most difficult and challenging patients that you've had, maybe one or two examples that you yourself have learned from in the process where a person has come into something and you're like, I'm shocked about that. And then we're able to like reconfigure the way you were approaching it because then people can get a little bit of a grasp of that recovery process from a, uh, from an example point of view. So folks, we'll be back in just a moment. We'll see what what's going to happen with what Linda will tell us about that question back in just a moment. 
Today, the world of mind science, psychiatry, and mental health is rapidly changing with innovative, comprehensive testing that takes both patients and practitioners into a new world of measured details with useful, understandable, and remarkably actionable plans. The key phrase here is cost-effective. Testing also introduces a key parallel word, predictability. Psychiatric treatment failure, especially after multiple medications and our brief hospitalizations, arises directly from the complexity of measurable brain-body imbalances and impediments that explicitly interfere with medical outcomes and create costly difficulties with inadequately informed supplement and medication trials over time. Great Plains provides a leadership team of biomedical experts with advanced laboratory insights approved nationally both by the FDA and CLIA laboratory certifications and is available internationally for both public and medical professions. Great Plains Laboratory is the primary laboratory we've used at CoreSite for years with excellent customer service for both patients and medical colleagues. They are on the spot, they get it every time. In addition, they provide exemplary training modules, which are webinars and conferences, in an effort to broaden practice perspectives wherever you live. Do follow up on one of these complimentary test offers today at http greatplainslaboratory.com forward slash cbj. Yeah, that's Core Brain Journal CBJ. Well, we're back, folks, with Linda Graham out there in beautiful downtown San Francisco, and she is telling us about resilience in such a useful, helpful way. And and we love the pithy quotes. We're going to try and get them, writing them down madly in the background here. We're going to do what we can to get as many of them as we can. But I mean, this is a book that you really need to take a look at. If you're a therapist, if you're a person like myself, who has had their systematic process of managing themselves challenged by the adversities of life, then this book is going to be for you. So the question I wanted Linda to address, if she could, it's interesting to see where the therapists themselves had, okay, I've got this understanding, but this was a surprise for me, and here's how I dealt with it, or this was something I learned from this whole situation. Can you share any examples like that? So here's how I would answer that. We mentioned earlier the importance of mindset. And I remember early on learning from one of my consultants that you could work with a client who is in resistance. You can work with a client who's in reluctance. You can't work with a client who's in refusal. The client has to buy into change as possible. So I found the most difficult patient is really the most difficult mindset. And it's the mindset that's called the drama triangle. And it's when people are in a mindset of being the victim looking for a rescuer, blaming people for being the persecutor. And when people are caught in that victim mindset, then they feel helpless. They don't take action on their own behalf. And everything becomes evidence that you see, this is never going to get any better. And so it's challenging that mindset because people need to feel empowered and claim their own empowerment if they're going to recover their resilience. So I just begin to work with where that mindset came from, but also why are they hanging on to it? <laughs> what purpose yeah. does it serve? Because the only way out of that drama triangle is to get out of that mindset, to not be a victim, not be a rescuer or look for rescuers, not be a persecutor or look for persecutors, but to simply step out of that triangle. So I look for very, very small moments when they actually made a decision, took action on their own behalf, pushed back in some way. And even if it was a small example, maybe you know they're challenging someone that made a mistake at the bank or something, mm -hmm. but if you move into that place of empowerment, let's grab that and make it grow, make it grow, make it grow until it's a new platform that the person can stand on within. They need some sense of empowerment. So then I will use the tools. Okay, so say they're still in their victim stance. Are they willing to try one of the many, many tools that I will teach them. And if they can experience their sense of self shifting or their relationship to the event shifting, if they can experience something budging, then they have a sense of success and maybe I can become resilient. Mm -hmm. And I just keep teaching those tools little by little by little 
hand on the heart, pulling in your circle of support, changing every should to a could. There are many tools. If they can make a little bit of difference, they begin to get the experience that they can make a lot of difference. Now, you used a word there. I want to make sure I got it down because I thought that was such an important word and such an evocative word. And that was something, the the phrase you used there, the person who just plain old resistant, was that the word you were saying? Resistant, reluctant, and refusing. Okay. Okay. Yeah. I had an adolescent come by this this afternoon and I was doing a, a medical evaluation. I'm not doing psychotherapy. I'm just trying to make a connection with this guy. He's 17 years old. He's almost 18 years old. And he's eye rolling, huffing and puffing and, you know, just squirming around over the whole thing. And the thing is, it almost winds up becoming kind of a family therapy situation because his father is being completely disrespectful to the kid over there, you know, saying all this stuff. So I'm like trying to connect with the kid to pull him out of a hole while the father's banging him over the head with a shovel while I'm trying to pull him out. But just this little comment that you made is interesting. I think in retrospect, what I'm thinking about is I probably, because I was so busy in just trying to get the job done and having Mm -hmm. such a hard time communicating. I didn't think about this at the time. I think if I had it to do all over again, I'd boot the father out. That's really what I should have done. So what we know is the brain needs to feel safe to do its learning and changing. Now, coming back to our combat veterans, I've learned sometimes it's just not wise or possible for a combat veteran to feel safe. They can feel safer. Mm -hmm. Perhaps they can feel safer. But being in the military is not always a safe situation. Yeah. But when the person can feel safe, like your adolescent, not feeling safe if their father's pounding on them, but if they can feel safe with you in the mm-hmm. open, in the warmth, in the empathy of the relationship with you, we need a person to be able to come back into that sense of safety in their body to turn the brain back on, to turn on the neuroplasticity in the brain so that they can yeah. begin to learn something new. So that's always the prerequisite for good therapy. It's probably the prerequisite for any good relationship is a sense of safety. So well said. You know, you're saying it so much more articulately than I do when I'm talking to people. But I, I say, if we just squeak that barn door open a little bit and let the light in, you know, mm-hmm. and that's close to it. It's, a, it's metaphorically similar. But I think the thing is, if a person can see that little bit of light coming down the tunnel, that's another mm-hmm. metaphor. You, there, there's a little bit of positive and there's a hope and there's something we can go to. Now, I'm going to segue from that to Leonard Cohen's words from Anthem. Ring the bells that still can ring. Forget your perfect offering. There's a crack in everything. That's how the light gets in. The thing I think that is people's deepest, most reliable derailer of their resilience is a sense of shame, a sense of not being good enough, not being lovable, being a failure, being inadequate, not being worthy, like your adolescent might have been experiencing if his father's berating him. And so I'm finding that helping people come out of that sense of shame, out of the inner critic, into a sense of self-acceptance, self-appreciation, self-admiration, where they understand that they really are good, worthy, not perfect, but good and worthy human being. There's a crack in everything. We all feel fear or shame or anger, or we go ballistic from time to time. But to be able to accept that that's part of being a human being. So this is why I often teach tools from the Mindful Self-Compassion Protocol, There are many tools in my book with permissions of the the developers of that protocol to be able to know what's happening, to be be kind to ourselves in the moment Mm -hmm. that we're reacting the way we're reacting. Okay, so I'll I'll give you another little story from my own experience that might illustrate that. Simple story. Mm -hmm. We had a power outage one winter, no electricity for 36 hours in January. No heat, no lights, no stove, no refrigerator, no phone, and no internet. And I was okay until I got up in the morning and wanted to reconnect on the internet. And I noticed myself getting grumpy and cranky and it wasn't doing any good at all. So I walked into my kitchen and there's a magnet on my refrigerator given to me by one of my students saying, now I give myself all the compassion I need. And I go, yeah, right. I teach this stuff. So I stop, put my hand on my heart. May I be kind to myself in this moment. May I accept this moment exactly as it is. May I accept myself exactly as I am in this moment. May I give myself all the compassion and courageous action that I need. And I went through that protocol just twice. And I felt my brain open up. 
I felt my brain expand back out. And I go, well, wait a minute. I have internet at my office. That's 10 minutes away. And I tell the story as we know that our cyber duca can be a problem sometimes, but <laughs> yeah. not that that was the worst thing that ever happened. But I couldn't solve the problem when I was contracted and angry. And as soon as I'd be kind to myself, accept myself, as soon as I did that, my brain opened back up and could think again. So these practices don't solve the problem, but they put us in a functioning of the brain from which we can solve the problem. That's why these tools are so effective. Fantastic. So well said. I mean, that was great. I mean, because that is... You know, that's the practice right there. And that was the reason I was asking those questions, because you can see the value of it. You can actually do your own self-care, your own level of increased self-responsibility by taking care of yourself in a different way. You think you're taking care of yourself by kicking yourself around the barn, which is the way, you know, so many people think they're going to, you know, with some kind of admonition is going to work. You know, I think we do have a responsibility to be resilient. I think that's true. As human beings, life is hard. That's inevitable. But we have a responsibility to learn how to be resilient. And if we're parents or if we're therapists or if we're coaches or if we're business leaders or whatever, we have a responsibility to learn how to be resilient. And one of the things that I also teach from that mindful self-compassion protocol, because I have had difficult clients who are really struggling and really upset and a little overwhelmed and overwhelming. So I do compassion for me, compassion for you. I breathe in compassion for myself as the therapist. I breathe out compassion for them as the patient. Now, I'm sitting there listening. I'm responding. I'm engaged with them. But I have that practice going on in the back of my mind. Compassion for me, compassion for you, so that I can stay grounded, so that I can stay open mm -hmm. and not have to shut down or yeah. ask them to leave. Yeah. Or change the subject, <laughs> however carefully one might. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> right. Ouch. Right. Well, listen, this has been great. We got to wind up here, but I want to thank you so much for taking the time. This has been really helpful, Linda. We're going to have you on that a combat stress page for sure, because that's obviously a place to go. We're also going to have you on the mindset page because mindset is really absolutely important with this yeah. whole situation because it's elemental to what you're talking about. It, that's right. It's a structural change in the way you actually manage yourself and your life in the context of the reality that you're living in. This is That's right. That's right. Fantastic. And the more the more people can come into, you know, shifting from a fixed mindset to a growth mindset, as Carol Dweck thought, but coming into a growth mindset is where we're willing to try. We're willing to take risks. We're willing to fail and try again. And we need that growth mindset to be able to be resilient. So let's close with the website. I mean, people may be in their car going to work right here. We'll we'll have it on the show notes, but you want to say what your website is and where any place can get a, get a hold of you. Okay. Linda Graham, dash M as in Mary, F as in Frank, T as in Tom, dot net. And everything on the website, my weekly posts are posted there. The video interviews I've done with other experts on resilience are posted there. The calendar of my trainings and workshop is posted there. So there's a lot of resources. They're all free. They're all easily downloadable. And people can use them in a very immediate fashion to recover their resilience. So it's all freely offered. Thank you so much for doing it. Thanks for, thanks for that big offer too. I mean, people can run over there and get some more out of it. I mean, if you're on this resilience path, if you really start thinking about the relevance for every single person, for every single life, I mean, this is a major contribution. I can't tell you how much I appreciate you being on board here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You have a great day out there in San Francisco. <laughs> I we'll will. Talk, we'll talk again soon. All right. Thanks for listening to Core Brain Journal. We're working every day behind the scenes to bring you reports that connect research benches with those street trenches. Here we share the complexity of mind science because, as you know, details really do matter. One of the most pervasive misunderstood challenges is how commonplace medications like those written for ADHD are used so regularly without clear guidelines. If you think you'd like more specifics, take a minute to download my two-page PDF packed with video links and references on the absolute essentials of how to start ADHD medications. They're easily available at corebrainjournal.com forward slash start. 
Thanks for listening. Do connect and stay tuned. Together we can make a difference. 